Maglev Trains, next on Enviro Close Up. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. The subject, Maglev Trains, and with us is Ernest Fazio. He's the Director of Communications of an organization called Maglev 2000. Welcome, Ernest. Thank you, thank you for having me. And let me read, just to start off, let me read, this is from the British newspaper, uh, The Guardian. Clean, green, quick and quiet, no wheels, no engines to fail, able to stop quickly and safely and glide off noiselessly on a, on a cushion of air. And then the piece goes on talking about maglev train. Magne maglev, incidentally, is for magnetic levitation. Yes, it is. And <clears throat> the cushion of air that you talk about is really not a cushion of air. It's a cushion of of a uh, magnetic field. It's like when you took those two little toys when you were a kid and you put them in a different polarity, they pushed away from each other. Yeah. That's the principle on which it works. It works in, in a vacuum actually, uh, but it would, uh, you know, it, air does not present a, uh, a, a lot of resistance to it. Well, let's go into it because people hearing of mag maglev trains and this whole notion of maglev, magnetic levitation, First thing, how does maglev work? When you take, well, the, the original magnetically levitated trains were um, these big iron core uh, magnets that uh, we created a magnetic field. And you had a pad from, on which it interacted, interacted with, and it would hold it off the thing. Now, to do this, you needed a lot of power, and it really couldn't hold much more than the passenger train. And the spaces between the, the track and the vehicle were like three eighths to a half inch. That is dangerous. The new maglev, the superconducting, has four and a half inches of float. Uh, it's, it's so powerful that it, it hovers the uh, uh, track about four and a half inches. And why is that important? Because if you have ice and snow, uh, it will not impair the function of the vehicle. If it's built in the air and the, and the maglev is look, looks like that, the track looks like that, the snow falls off. Even if you get a little snow, it'll blow away. Ice does not, is, is uh, if it, you have ice, it will stick to the track. But ice is magnetically transparent, so it doesn't matter. In other words, the magnetic power or force goes right through ice. Goes right. This starts at the, the turn into the last century research on maglev. The first writings on this was 1909, I think. And uh, so they knew the principle. Uh, everybody who's ever had two magnets together knows that it would work in theory. Nobody created anything that would work until much later. And uh, the two principal uh, researchers on that was a nuclear physicist uh, named uh, Jim Powell and uh, Gordon Danby, who was uh, an expert on magnets. He is, by the way, the guy who worked with Dr. Demadian in making the MRI. He designed the magnets for all of, the, his, all of his work in his early work. Now, these two scientists worked at Brookhaven National Laboratory. They worked at, uh, 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 at Brookhaven National Laboratories on the um, accelerator, and, which was a big, big project, and they became very close friends. But they did this on their own as, you know, a side project um, while they were, you know, s still working, but uh, they did it into their retirement. And it's a reality. I mean, there's a maglev train in, in China. Well, I went to China and I went on their uh, version of it, which was actually built by the Germans. And that is a mag. Uh, uh, what do you call it, an electric ma electromagnet, has very small toler tolerances. It has a very expensive switching system because it can't uh, glide from one track to another. It has to actually move the whole track. These things cost about $500,000 a piece. 
the, the, the Japanese used the superconducting magnets just like we did, but they didn't do it quite the same way, and they still used the very expensive switching devices. So a switching device to get it one, from one track to the other costs, again, $500,000 or more maybe now. We do this the, a switching device for less than $40,000. So what you're saying is that the American or the... The American is the better model. model. And, and it was developed out of, out of an American national laboratory on Long Island, where yeah. you're from, Brookhaven National Laboratory. And it seemed to ha have been just inches away from becoming reality over the last several decades. Well, I think it was 1992, they brought it to uh, Senator Moynihan. Senator Moynihan was one of those uh, Renaissance men who could understand a lot of different things. Uh, as good as he was at politics, he was even good at science. And they explained it to him and they, he liked it. And he went to the Senate and made a presentation to the Senate and lobbied for it, got $750 million. They brought it over to the House of Representatives where uh, the lobbying efforts of the automobile industry, the trucking industry, and the airline industry uh, did not allow that $750 million to become a reality. I mean, because of a vested interest. Vested interest. It's, you know, it's an old story in our country, and we're still doing it. We, uh, the guy who uh, greases the palm of the guy in the office gets the, the work done that he wants done. So as a result, we do not have it. Uh, I don't know that, um, I don't want to badmouth the, the, the politics of our country as opposed to other countries, but they don't seem to have as much trouble doing things like that. Well, I mean, it's just a shame. I mean, here you have the roads in America so crowded. Uh, it's, it's, it's an ordeal with the, with the congestion. Uh, you often have to take a plane because the train service uh, doesn't really it doesn't, I mean, for, for these kinds of industries, because the maglev train would represent. The maglev train, if we built it, is bigger than the interstate highway. The, the interstate highway, it was one of the greatest boons to uh, the economic health of this country. Anytime you do anything like the Erie Canal or the uh, Panama Canal, you create such economies of uh, moving things cheaper that it, it reflects in every aspect of the economy. So if we could move, let's say, freight on a maglev train, you can't do it on, on the ones that the Chinese built, that the Germans built for the Chinese, because their electromagnets are so heavy that most of the energy is used just to keep the vehicle up. So all you can put on there is passengers, which are a very small percentage of the total lo load. Whereas if you use superconducting magnets like in our the design, what you'll be able to do is put two 50-ton trucks on one car in an, em in an envelope that's aerodynamic and move it at 300 miles an hour. Now, to give you an idea of what uh, moving freight on a, on a tractor trailer is, it, it involves something like $3,500 in fuel and uh, tolls. We can do the same thing. We can get two cars, two, two trucks on a train and move them with $1,100 worth of electricity. And you're talking about $3,500 over a certain distance? $3,500 coast to coast. $3,500 coast to coast. That's just the fuel and the tolls. Now, this that, is now these are all figures. They could be more. This is Enviro close-up. Our focus is on the environment. What, in your view, are the environmental advantages of a maglev train? Well, the vehicle itself has no uh, environmental uh, carbon or anything like that or, or pollution from it. You do need electricity to make the train work. Now, that could be done in, uh, in uh, you know, a carbon-producing power plant, but it could also be done with uh, arrays of, uh, of solar, and it could be done with wind. Ideally, what you would have is an array of solar right across the country on one side of the tracks facing the sun to pick up the, the, the sun. 
when you're not in full sun, you'd be able to uh, go to power plants to, uh, to furnish the uh, electricity that you need. But it would be, um, you know, it's a, it's a big capital investment uh, getting in the, but another thing about capital investment on real estate, when Eisenhower proposed the interstate highway, he designated the center to be for a train. We haven't done that. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, that's all part of the law. And uh, what they've done is, in many places, they've compromised that uh, piece of real estate in the middle. But we could still build it outside of the uh, uh, right-of-way, and uh, all we need is stanchions on that. And, and to do it outside of the uh, pattern of the interstate is even more, makes even more sense. When I was in China, we were, uh, I was on a train, we were doing 274 miles an hour. Now, the reason why we weren't going faster is because the run was too short because then when you get to 274 miles an hour, you had to decelerate again to get to you know, the next uh, stop. So <clears throat> when another train passed at the same rate of speed, you could feel a bump like that. That's a very disconcerting thing to have happen. But the train was only 15 feet apart. What if you had 150 feet in between, or 200 feet, or whatever a highway is, uh, maybe it's more like 300 feet, you would have no impact whatsoever. Now there's been a proposal, I mean the speed is, uh, this isn't even like, the, what, what is it called, the Acela train? Uh, the Acela train at its best is 125 miles an hour. And we're talking here way beyond 200 and... We're talking, we're talking reasonably 300 miles an hour. Now that doesn't mean you're going to average 300 miles an hour what, because you're going to stop. But if you go 300 miles an hour, let's say from let's say you're going from here to Boston, most of the trip will be at 300 miles an hour. Only a short piece of it will be at the lower speeds when you're making you may be making two or three stops. Now I've seen the plan, and it's been written about, of having a maglev train run between New York and Washington, which is well, it's the busiest train route uh, in the United well, States. It, that's that's fraught with problems because oh, really, yeah, <clears throat> the, 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 because if you're going to use the right of ways of the railroad, uh, you you're going to disrupt. You're going to be very disruptive. But if you use the the interstate, you might be able to do it very well. I don't know. I don't. I haven't really examined that, but uh, I think it's possible. But I know we can go from Grand Central Station to Newburgh. Right without a lot of disruption. Uh, because first of all, they've modified the uh, maglev so that instead of having the, 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 you know, the magnets uh, on the side of the, in, you know, the, the configuration of the car, the bottom of the car is something like that, and the magnets are here, and the words on the rails that way. You can put the magnets up on the top and uh, run it on pads between the tracks or around the side as a train. Well, at 300 miles an hour, even with the stops, it would shorten a trip, a train trip, or a maglev train trip to, uh, I mean, it would, it would be a... F well, let's take Stewart Airport, for example. I went up to Stewart Airport and I spoke to the managers up there and I said, what's your uh, catch basin? You know, catch basin means the radius from which you draw your uh, people. And I looked at it and I says, you don't include Manhattan. You don't include that in any part of New York City. And they said, yeah, it's too far away. I said, if I could get passengers from Grand Central Station to Stewart Airport in less time than it takes from uh, a person in Manhattan to go to LaGuardia, would that be attractive? He says, there'll be a knockout. I said, we can do that. We can actually get there faster than going to LaGuardia. Because if you leave New Manhattan, in a taxi cab to go to LaGuardia, you're 45 minutes. We can do that in about 30 minutes. So it would be 30 minutes from, from, men, from, from Grand, Grand Central, Central to, it's actually all up in New, Newburgh is the old Stewart Air Force Base. But, but that is it. Which has been made into uh, a major airport, but the problem with that airport is that taking a car to, uh, to, 
to Newburgh is, uh, is arduous, actually. It's time consuming and it, it's really not workable. Because they don't get any customers. So I said to the manager, I said, why do you call yourself an international airport? Where do you go? And he said, we go to Canada. I said, oh, I guess that makes you international. <laughs> but nobody's going to Europe. Well, there's probably a couple of, uh, that was five or seven years ago. They probably have a few flights going to Europe now, but uh, to be a major bustling airport, you need uh, you need to get a lot of people in your uh, in your catch basin. Now, now what is the state of uh, the push for maglev trains in the United States? Where does it stand? It has no friends that I know of. People will hear my story and they listen and they say, that sounds terrific. Why does it work? And I said, it does work. It works in, in Japan. Japan is now expanding their system. They had, and their system is far more expensive than ours. So they're doing it at a much higher expense. And they're still not carrying freight. We can carry freight. And, and do, are all the problems worked out? I'm sure they're not. I'm sure they're not. If we start building this tomorrow, we're going to say, oh, we got to do this better. we got to do this better. Did we go to the moon? For goodness sakes, well, if we can go to the moon, we can go to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Quick. Uh, you keep talking about freight. I think people perhaps aren't familiar with the advantage of carrying freight on a train over passengers. Well, the, there's a myriad of advantages. First of all, a truck burns diesel fuel. It's very bad for the environment, and it's uh, a danger to people on the road. So if we can put these trucks on, uh, you can do it there's several ways. You can put it, the trucks, the whole trucks themselves, and you can put the truck driver in a, in a passenger pod, and he can drive the truck when he gets off. Or you can have a truck driver come into the uh, station in San Francisco or Los Angeles or wherever it winds up and drive the truck away. You don't have to have the truck driver there, but you can. The economics of carrying freight compared to the economics of carrying passengers for a, for a rail company. The economics of carrying freight, let's say, for a rail company is enormous. They do very, very well. And what happened is our wonderful Congress what they did was they gave away most of the track to the commercial uh, carriers, the, uh, you know, the freight trains. So I went to Chicago a couple of years ago on a train. It took me 17 hours. There was a couple of hours here where I stepped, went on to a siding, and a couple of hours there where I went off the, on a siding. That's crazy. That's crazy. Why, was, why am I waiting on it? That used to belong to the people. Those tracks used to belong to the people. And now I have to wait for a tra uh, 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 100 cars of track uh, of uh, freight trains to go by so that they can make money, which is good, but I like them, everybody making money. But you're not going to be able to service um, even a conventional rail at that rate. 17 hours is not acceptable. Besides that, in terms of dollars, Companies involved in railways make more money on freight than they do with passengers? Well, yes, they make, there is no money in, in passenger freight. No money no, in passenger? No, in, in passenger carriers. Really? There is not one railroad in the world, bar none, that makes money on passengers. They're all subsidized. Really? Freight makes money. They get more revenue out of, if I can take a, uh, a freight car full of a product and I have, you know, the very few, very low fuel, because you get ready, gotta remember, I'm pulling a hundred cars and I've got one or maybe two locomotives. If I'm do, using that same uh, hundred cars, I'm using a thousand trucks, maybe more, a thousand trucks, and they all have a motor and they're all burning fuel. This is, that's why it's, that's why freight rail companies make money. 
Now, you're, you're a co-author of a book, an important book about Maglev. Maglev. Yeah, it's uh, called let me, Maglev America. Yeah, it's, it's uh, available on Amazon. Yeah, and I think that there's a, a subtitle, How Maglev Will Transform the World's Economy. I mean, that, that's, that's a serious uh, title. I think it will. I do think if it, it happens, will. though, Ernie. <laughs> First of all, it, it's going to transform the world in many, many ways. If I can get out on the interstate and I never see a truck, I'm, 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 immediately I'm moving a lot faster. But more, moreover, if I have maglev, I'm also moving passengers, so I'm not going to see a lot of as many cars either. Uh, what about safety? You know, uh, if you take a conventional train and you get it up to say 60 miles an hour, do you know how long it takes to stop that train? Oh. About 780 feet I, or, or more. I think it's a lot more. It, it, uh, that, might, that might be the low end number. But if I'm doing 60 miles in an automobile, how far, how many feet do I need to stop? Five car lengths is what they say. 88. 88 huh? feet. That doesn't mean, that's 88 feet without you going through the windshield. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a nice fast stop. You can do that, in a, you can do it faster in a, in a maglev. You wouldn't want to because- well, how, how quick could you stop conceivably in a maglev train? Well, if you're at top speed, 300 miles an hour, yeah, it'd probably take you about a thousand feet. A thousand feet. Yeah. But that's- That's nothing compared to what, it, uh, it would be three miles with a, with, a, with, a, with a conventional train. Three miles as opposed to a thousand feet. In other words, what I'm saying is that if you see a school bus on, stuck on the uh, crossing, r railroad crossing, and you're the engineer, if you can see that, and you're doing 60 miles an hour or more, run to the back of the train, because that's going to hit the school bus. There's no question about it. It's, you cannot stop the, the train fast enough. With a maglev, you'd be able to, you'd be hands down, you'd, you'd, you'd save, uh, you'd do it in 88 feet. Now, besides being active in uh, promoting, pushing, doing all you can to get maglev to happen, you're the leader of a group uh, on Long Island in New York, uh, it was the Long Island- Long Island Metro Business Action. Metro Business Action. So you're involved with not just scientists from, uh, the nearby national lab, no, Brookhaven, which I'm is a involved with the local bank, the guy who makes you, uh, you know, the retailer on Main Street, and, and any kind of business. We we try to do things that accommodate good business practices. But you're involved in a, on all levels. You're government officials, right. business people, uh, citizens groups, and stuff. Your organization. We really all, are very varied, and we even bring in, uh, you know, people from the universities. I've had uh, Bob Scott from Adelphi, and uh, I've had uh, Sam Sam. You, you, you've had me speak before. Yes, I've had you. Uh, about the dangers of nuclear power. How are you doing in terms of influencing? I mean, and, and this is where the... Uh, you know, I don't think we ever know. I don't think we ever know what, what our influence is. Every once in a while, I'll get somebody saying, thank you so much for the work that you do. You've, you know, you've helped me understand yeah. things. People just don't, you know, give you that, that, those kind of, that kind of feedback uh, a lot, you know, but you do get some. Well, how, how could a maglev become a reality? How, in fact, like the book title says, can the world be transformed by this high-speed, non-polluting vehicle? Well, here's one of the things I'm working on, Carl. Uh, there's a, a segment of track between Ronkonkoma and Riverhead. And, On Long Island. And they, they run a train, I think, once a day. And it's the most expensive, uh, you know, route that they have. Yeah, they don't collect enough money to satisfy the route, even though they only run one train a day. They could run one car every half hour if they had maglev. What would happen if you had one car? It would be more like a subway train. When I lived in Manhattan years ago, I never had a schedule on the, the subway trains. They were, I don't even think they existed. I go into the hole, pull out my newspaper, and five minutes later I had a train. 
And it was always there. When people know that they have a train or a, a transportation system at their disposal without them ever having to worry about the time of day and all that stuff, they'll use it. So if, let's say we, had, we ran that train from uh, Riverhead to uh, Ronkonkoma. Let's say that they get uh, 300 people on that train a day. I don't think they do, but if, let's say they do. I'd say that number would go up to 3,000 a day if that, was, uh, if that was the case, because people who needed to get from those places. Now, you don't have to go fast to have a, a successful maglev. You can go the, uh, the speed of a subway or a Long Island Railroad, but because it, each, none of them require an engine, they all, they just, you can put as many as you want on them. And then, by the way, they, they don't, uh, they can't hit each other because they're on the same wavelength. And so if the wavelength stops, everything stops. You know? oh, really, huh? Yeah. I mean, here we are in the United States, uh, now near 20 years into the 21st century, congestion all over the place. Uh, I mean, Los Angeles is uh, probably the biggest uh, auto-congested uh, city in, in, the, in the country, but I mean, there's congestion really in and around every city. The air service, there's some bad weather, there's a bad storm, and suddenly thousands of flights are canceled, so that becomes really impractical as a, de as a dependable uh, vehicle of transportation. Well, as I was saying before, would that wouldn't have any effect? No, not, not on a maglev. And uh, then with train service, uh, it's, it's frankly, it's, uh, it's non-existent or barely existent all over this country. Well, I've made two train trips in the last 10 years. One was to uh, Fort Lauderdale. That was 27 hours, 27 hours. And, and it was because of all of the airports were closed down uh, for snowstorm in that particular case. And, I want to tell you something about the personnel on those trains. Marvelous. They're the most courteous, helpful people you'll ever meet. But the train itself is not a successful model. And we're, like, like on that train trip, out of time too. Thank you so much, Ernie Fazio, uh, to tell us all we ever wanted to know about maglev trains. Now the challenge, can maglev trains become reality? Thank you for, for watching all over the world, not just in China. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I'm Carl Grossman.